Welcome. This is your most sane gotcha tuber, Astra. I hope you are having an amazing day, all of my socials are down below as always. Love you guys, enjoy. Separate Piece by John Knowles, Chapter 1 I went back to the Devon school not long ago, and found it looking oddly newer than when I was a student there 15 years before. It seemed more sedate than I remembered it, more perpendicular and straight-laced, with narrower windows and shinier woodwork, as though a coat of varnish had been put over everything for better preservation. But, of course, 15 years before there had been a war going on. Perhaps the school wasn't as well kept up in those days, perhaps varnish, along with everything else, had gone to war. I didn't entirely like this glossy new surface, because it made the school look like a museum, and that's exactly what it was to me, and what I did not want it to be. In the deep, tacit way in which feeling becomes stronger than thought, I had always felt that the Devon school came into existence the day I entered it, was vibrantly real while I was a student there, and then blinked out like a candle the day I left. Now here it was after all, preserved by some considerate hand with varnish and wax. Preserved along with it, like stale air in an unopened room, was the well-known fear which had surrounded and filled those days, so much of it that I hadn't even known it was there. Because, unfamiliar with the absence of fear and what that was like, I had not been able to identify its presence. Looking back now across 15 years, I could see with great clarity the fear I had lived in, which must mean that in the interval I had succeeded in a very important undertaking, I must have made my escape from it. I felt fear's echo, and along with that I felt the unhinged, uncontrollable joy which had been its accompaniment and opposite face, joy, which had broken out, sometimes in those days like northern lights across black sky. There were a couple of places now, which I wanted to see. Both were fearful sights, and that was why I wanted to see them. So after lunch at the Devon Inn I walked back toward the school. It was a raw, nondescript time of year, toward the end of November, the kind of wet, self-pitying November day, when every speck of dirt stands out clearly. Devon luckily had very little of such weather, the icy clamp of winter, or the radiant New Hampshire summers, were more characteristic of it, but this day it blew wet, moody gusts all around me. I walked along Gilman Street, the best street in town. The houses were as handsome and as unusual as I remembered. Clever modernizations of old colonial manses, extensions in Victorian wood, capacious Greek revival temples lined the street, as impressive and just as forbidding as ever. I had rarely seen anyone go into one of them, or anyone playing on a lawn, or even an open window. Today with their failing ivy and stripped, moaning trees, the houses looked both more elegant and more lifeless than ever. Like all old, good schools, Devon did not stand isolated behind walls and gates, but emerged naturally from the town which had produced it. So there was no sudden moment of encounter as I approached it, the houses along Gilman Street began to look more defensive, which meant that I was near the school, and then more exhausted, which meant that I was in it. It was early afternoon and the grounds and buildings were deserted, since everyone was at sports. There was nothing to distract me as I made my way across a wide yard, called the Far Commons, and up to a building as red brick and balanced as the other major buildings, but with a large cupola and a bell and a clock and Latin over the doorway, the first academy building. In through swinging doors I reached a marble foyer, and stopped at the foot of a long white marble flight of stairs. Although they were old stairs, the worn moons in the middle of each step were not very deep. The marble must be unusually hard. That seemed very likely, only too likely, although with all my thought about these stairs, this exceptional hardness had not occurred to me. It was surprising that I had overlooked that, that crucial fact. There was nothing else to notice, they of course were the same stairs I had walked up and down at least once every day of my Devon life. They were the same as ever. And I? Well, I naturally felt older, I began at that point the emotional examination to note how far my convalescence had gone, I was taller, bigger generally in relation to these stairs. I had more money and success and security than in the days when specters seemed to go up and down them with me. I turned away and went back outside. The far common was still empty, and I walked alone down the wide gravel paths among those most republican, bankers of trees, New England, elms, toward the far side of the school. Devon is sometimes considered the most beautiful school in New England, and even on this dismal afternoon its power was asserted. 
It is the beauty of small areas of order, a large yard, a group of trees, three similar dormitories, a circle of old houses, living together in contentious harmony. You felt that an argument might begin again any time, in fact it had, out of the dean's residence, a pure and authentic colonial house, there now sprouted an L with a big bare picture window, someday the dean would probably live entirely encased in a house of glass and be happy as a sandpiper. Everything at Devon slowly changed and slowly harmonized with what had gone before. So it was logical to hope that since the buildings and the deans and the curriculum could achieve this, I could achieve, perhaps unknowingly already had achieved, this growth and harmony myself. I would know more about that when I had seen the second place I had come to see. So I roamed on past the balanced red brick dormitories with webs of leafless ivy clinging to them, through a ramshackle salient of the town which invaded the school for a hundred yards, past the solid gymnasium, full of students at this hour but silent as a monument on the outside, past the field house, called the cage, I remembered now what a mystery references to the cage had been during my first weeks at Devon, I had thought it must be a place of severe punishment, and I reached the huge open sweep of ground known as the playing fields. Devon was both scholarly and very athletic, so the playing fields were vast and, except at such a time of year, constantly in use. Now they reached soggily and emptily away from me, forlorn, tennis courts on the left, enormous football and soccer and lacrosse fields in the center, woods on the right, and at the far end a small river detectable from this distance by the few bare trees along its banks. It was such a gray and misty day that I could not see the other side of the river, where there was a small stadium. I started the long trudge across the fields and had gone some distance before I paid any attention to the soft and muddy ground, which was dooming my city shoes. I didn't stop. Near the center of the fields there were thin lakes of muddy water, which I had to make my way around, my unrecognizable shoes making obscene noises as I lifted them out of the mire. With nothing to block it, the wind flung wet gusts at me. At any other time I would have felt like a fool slogging through mud and rain, only to look at a tree. A little fog hung over the river so that as I neared it I felt myself becoming isolated from everything except the river and the few trees beside it. The wind was blowing more steadily here, and I was beginning to feel cold. I never wore a hat, and had forgotten gloves. There were several trees bleakly reaching into the fog. Any one of them might have been the one I was, looking for. Unbelievable that there were other trees, which looked like it here. It had loomed in my memory as a huge lone spike, dominating the riverbank, forbidding as an artillery piece, high, as the beanstalk. Yet here was a scattered grove of trees, none of them of any particular grandeur. Moving through the soaked, coarse grass I began to examine each one closely, and finally identified the tree I was looking for by means of certain small scars rising along its trunk, and by, a limb extending over the river, and another thinner limb, growing near it. This was the tree, and it seemed to me standing there to resemble those men, the giants of your childhood, whom you, encounter years later and find that they are not merely smaller in relation to your growth, but that they are absolutely smaller, shrunken by age. In this double demotion, the old giants have become pygmies, while you were looking the other way. The tree was not only stripped by the cold season, it seemed weary from age, enfeebled, dry. I was thankful, very thankful that I had seen it. So the more things remain the same, the more they change after all, plus say la mean, chose, plus see a change. Nothing endures, not a tree, not love, not even a death by violence. Changed, I headed back through the mud. I was drenched, anybody could see it was time to come in out of the rain. The tree was tremendous, an irate, steely black, steeple, beside the river. I was damned if I'd climb it. The hell with it. No one but Phineas could think up such a crazy idea. He of course saw nothing the slightest bit intimidating about it. He wouldn't or wouldn't admit it if he did. Not Phineas. What I like best about this tree, he said in that voice of his, the equivalent in sound of a hypnotist's eyes, what I like is that it's such a cinch. He opened his green eyes wider and gave us his maniac look, and only the smirk on his wide mouth with its droll slightly protruding upper lip reassured us that he wasn't completely goofy. Is that what you like best? I said sarcastically. I said a lot of things sarcastically that summer, 
that was my sarcastic summer, 1942, A-E-A, he said, this weird New England affirmative, maybe it is spelled A-I-E-H-A, always made me laugh, as Finney knew, so I had to laugh, which made me feel less sarcastic and less scared. There were three others with us, Phineas in those days almost always moved in groups the size of a hockey team, and they stood with me looking with massed apprehension from him to the tree. Its soaring black trunk was set with rough wooden pegs, leading up to a substantial limb, which extended farther toward the water. Standing on this limb, you could by a prodigious effort jump far enough out into the river, for safety, so we had heard. At least the 17-year-old bunch could do it, but they had a crucial year's advantage over us. No upper middler, which was the name for our class in the Devon school, had ever tried. Naturally, Finney was going to be the first to try, and just as naturally he was going to inveigle others, us, into trying it with him. We were not even upper middler exactly. For this was the summer session, just established to keep up with the pace of the war. We were in shaky transit that summer from the groveling status of lower middlers to the near respectability of upper middlers. The class above, seniors, draft bait, practically soldiers, rushed ahead of us toward the war. They were caught up in accelerated courses and first aid programs and a physical hardening regimen, which included jumping from this tree. We were still calmly, numbly reading Virgil and playing tag in the river farther downstream, until Finney thought of the tree. We stood looking up at it, for looks of consternation, one of excitement, do you want to go first? Finney asked us, rhetorically, we just looked quietly back at him, and so he began taking off his clothes, stripping down to his underpants. For such an extraordinary athlete, even as a lower middler Phineas had been the best athlete in the school, he was not spectacularly built. He was my height, 5 feet 8 and a half inches, I had been claiming 5 feet 9 inches before he became my roommate, but he had said in public with that simple, shocking self-acceptance of his. No, you're the same height I am, five eight and a half. We're on the short side. He weighed 150 pounds, a galling 10 pounds more than I did, which flowed from his legs to torso around shoulders to arms and full strong neck in an uninterrupted, unemphatic unity of strength. He began scrambling up the wooden pegs, nailed to the side of the tree, his back muscles working like a panther's. The pegs didn't seem strong enough to hold his weight. At last, he stepped onto the branch, which reached a little farther toward the water. Is this the one they jump from? None of us knew. If I do it, you're all going to do it, aren't you? We didn't say anything very clearly. Well, he cried out, here's my contribution to the war effort, and he sprang out, fell through the tops of some lower branches, and smashed into the water. Great, he said, bobbing instantly to the surface again, his wet hair plastered in droll bangs on his forehead. That's the most fun I've had this week. Who's next? I was. This tree flooded me with a sensation of alarm all the way to my tingling fingers. My head began to feel unnaturally light, and the vague rustling sounds from the nearby woods came to me as though muffled and filtered. I must have been entering a mild state of shock. Insulated by this, I took off my clothes and started to climb the pegs. I don't remember saying anything. The branch he had jumped from was slenderer than it looked from the ground and much higher. It was impossible to walk out on it far enough to be well over the river. I would have to spring far out or risk falling into the shallow water next to the bank. Come on, drawled Finney from below, stop standing there showing off. I recognized with automatic tenseness that the view was very impressive from here. When they torpedo the troop ship, he shouted, you can't stand, around admiring the view. Jump, what was I doing up here anyway? Why did I let Finney talk me into stupid things like this? Was he getting some kind of hold over me? Jump, with the sensation that I was throwing my life away, I jumped into space. Some tips of branches snapped past me, and then I crashed into the water. My legs hit the soft mud of the bottom, and immediately I was on the surface being congratulated. I felt fine. I think that was better than Finney's, said Elwyn, better known as Leper, Lepelier, who was bidding for an ally in the dispute he foresaw. All right, pal, Finney spoke in his cordial, penetrating voice, that reverberant instrument in his chest, don't start awarding prizes until you've passed the course. The tree is waiting. Leper closed his mouth, as though forever. He didn't argue, or refuse. He didn't back away. He became inanimate. 
But the other two, Chet Douglas and Bobby Zane, were vocal enough, complaining shrilly about school regulations, the danger of stomach cramps, physical disabilities they had never mentioned before. It's you, pal, Finney said to me, at last, just you and me. He and I started back across the fields, preceding the others like two seniors. We were the best of friends at that moment. You were very good, said Finney, good-humoredly, once I shamed you into it. You didn't shame anybody into anything. Oh yes I did. I'm good for you that way. You have a tendency to back away from things otherwise. I never backed away from anything in my life. I cried, my indignation at this charge, naturally stronger, because it was so true. You're goofy, Phineas just walked serenely on, or rather float on, rolling forward in his white sneakers with such unthinking unity of movement that walk didn't describe it. I went along beside him across the enormous, playing fields toward the gym. Underfoot the healthy green turf was brushed with dew, and ahead of us we could see a faint green haze hanging above the grass, shot through with the twilight sun. Phineas stopped talking for once, so that now I could hear cricket noises and bird cries of dusk, a gymnasium truck gunning along an empty athletic road a quarter of a mile away. A burst of faint, isolated laughter carried to us from the back door of the gym, and then over all, cool and matriarchal, the six o'clock bell from the academy building cupola, the calmest, most carrying bell toll in the world, civilized, calm, invincible, and final. The toll sailed over the expansive tops of all the elms, the great slanting roofs, and formidable chimneys of the dormitories, the narrow and brittle old house tops, across the open New Hampshire sky to us coming back from the river. We'd better hurry, or we'll be late for dinner, I said, breaking into what Finney called my West Point stride. Phineas didn't really dislike West Point in particular, or authority in general but just considered authority the necessary evil against, which happiness was achieved by reaction, the backboard, which returned all the insults he threw at it. My West Point stride was intolerable, his right foot flashed into the middle of my fast, walk and I went pitching forward into the grass, get those 150 pounds off me. I shouted, because he was sitting on my back, Finney got up, patted my head genially, and moved on across the field, not deigning to glance around for my counterattack but relying on his extrasensory ears, his ability to feel in the air someone coming on him from behind. As I sprang at him he sidestepped easily, but I just managed to kick him as I shot past. He caught my leg and there was a brief wrestling match on the turf which he won. Better hurry, he said, or they'll put you in the guardhouse. We were walking again, faster, Bobby and Leper and Chet were, urging us from ahead for God's sake to hurry up, and then Finney trapped me again in his strongest trap, that is, I suddenly became his collaborator. As we walked rapidly along I abruptly resented the bell and my West Point stride and hurrying and conforming. Finney was right. And there was only one way to show him this. I threw my hip against his, catching him by surprise, and he was instantly down, definitely pleased. This was why he liked me so much. When I jumped on top of him, my knees on his chest, he couldn't ask for anything better. We struggled in some equality for a while, and then when we were sure we were too late for dinner, we broke off. He and I passed the gym and came on toward the first group of dormitories, which were dark and silent. There were only 200 of us at Devon in the summer, not enough to fill most of the school. We passed the sprawling headmaster's house, empty, he was doing something for the government in Washington, passed the chapel, empty again, used only for a short time in the mornings, past the first academy building, where there were some dim lights shining from a few of its many windows, masters at work in their classrooms there, down a short slope into the broad and well-clipped common, on which light fell from the big surrounding Georgian buildings. A dozen boys were loafing there on the grass after dinner, and a kitchen rattle from them. Wing of one of the buildings accompanied their talk. The sky was darkening steadily, which brought up the lights in the dormitories and the old houses. A loud phonograph a long way off played Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree, rejected that and played, They're Either Too Young or Too Old, grew more ambitious with the Warsaw Concerto, mellower with the Nutcracker Suite, and then stopped. Finney and I went to our room. Under the yellow study lights we read our hearty assignments. I was halfway through Tess of the D'Urberville, he carried on his baffled struggle with far from the madding crowd, amused that there should be people named Gabriel Oak and Bathsheba, Everdeen. Our illegal radio, turned too low to be intelligible, was broadcasting the news. 
Outside there was a rustling early summer movement of the wind, the seniors, a lot out later than we were, came fairly quietly back as the bell sounded ten stately times. Boys ambled past our door toward the bathroom, and there was a period of steadily pouring shower water. Then lights began to snap out all over the school. We undressed, and I put on some pajamas, but Phineas, who had heard they were unmilitary, didn't. There was the silence in which it was understood we were saying some prayers, and then that summer school day came to an end. Chapter 2, Our Absence from Dinner Had Been Noticed the following morning, the clean-washed shine of summer mornings in the North Country, Mr. Prudhomme stopped at our door. He was broad-shouldered, grave, and he wore a grey business suit. He did not have the careless, almost British look of most of the Devon masters, because he was a substitute for the summer. He enforced such rules as he knew, missing dinner was one of them. We had been swimming in the river, Finney explained, then there had been a wrestling match, then there was that sunset that anybody would want to watch, then there'd been several friends. We had to see on business, he rambled on, his voice soaring and plunging in its vibrant sound box, his eyes now, and then widening to fire a flash of green across the room. Standing in the shadows, with the bright window behind him, he blazed with sunburnt health. As Mr. Prudhomme looked at him and listened to the scatterbrained eloquence of his explanation, he could be seen rapidly losing his grip on sternness. If you hadn't already missed nine meals in the last two weeks, he broke in, but Finney pressed his advantage. Not because he wanted to be forgiven for missing the meal, that didn't interest him at all, he might have rather enjoyed the punishment if it was done in some novel and unknown way. He pressed his advantage because he saw that Mr. Prudhomme was pleased, won over in spite of himself. The master was slipping from his official position, momentarily, and it was just possible, if Phineas pressed hard enough, that there might be a flow of simple, unregulated friendliness between them, and such flows were one of Finney's reasons for living. The real reason, sir, was that we just had to jump out of that tree. You know that tree, I knew, Mr. Prudhomme must have known, Finney knew, if he stopped to think, that jumping out of the tree was even more forbidden than missing a meal. We had to do that, naturally, he went on, because we're all getting ready for the war. What if they lower the draft age to 17? Jean and I are both going to be 17 at the end of the summer, which is a very convenient time since it's the start of the academic year and there's never any doubt about which class you should be in. Leper Lepelier is already 17, and if I'm not mistaken he will be draftable before the end of this next academic year, and so conceivably he ought to have been in the class ahead, he ought to have been a senior now, if you see what I mean, so that he would have been graduated and been all set to be drafted. But we're all right, Jean and I are perfectly all right. There isn't any question that we are conforming in every possible way to everything that's happening and everything that's going to happen. It's all a question of birthdays, unless you want to be more specific and look at it from the sexual point of view, which I have never cared to do myself, since it's a question of my mother and my father, and I have never felt I wanted to think about their sexual lives too much. Everything he said was true and sincere, Finney always said, what he happened to be thinking, and if this stunned people, then he was surprised. Mr. Prudhomme released his breath with a sort of amazed laugh, stared at Finney for a while, and that was all there was to it. This was the way the masters tended to treat us that summer. They seemed to be modifying their usual attitude of floating, chronic disapproval. During the winter, most of them regarded anything unexpected in a student with suspicion, seeming to feel that anything we said or did was potentially illegal. Now on these clear June days in New Hampshire, they appeared to uncoil. They seemed to believe that we were with them about half the time, and only spent the other half, trying to make fools of them. A streak of tolerance was detectable, Finney decided that they were beginning to show commendable signs of maturity, it was partly his doing. The Devon faculty had never before experienced a student who combined a calm ignorance of the rules with a winning urge to be good, who seemed to love the school truly and deeply, and never more than when he was breaking the regulations, a model boy who was most comfortable in the truant's corner. The faculty threw up its hands over Phineas, and so loosened its grip on all of us. But there was another reason. I think we reminded them of what peace was like, we boys of 16. We were registered with no draft board, we had taken no physical examinations. No one had ever tested us for hernia or color blindness. 
trick knees and punctured eardrums were minor complaints and not yet disabilities, which would separate a few from the fate of the rest. We were, careless and wild, and I suppose we could be thought of as a sign of the life the war was being fought to preserve. Anyway, they were more indulgent toward us than at any other time, they, snapped at the heels of the seniors, driving and molding and arming them for the war. They noticed our games tolerantly. We reminded them of what peace was like, of lives which were not, bound up with destruction. Phineas was the essence of this careless peace. Not that he was unconcerned about the war. After Mr. Prudhomme left he began to dress, that is he began reaching for whatever clothes were nearest, some of them mine. Then he stopped to consider, and went over to the dresser. Out of one of the drawers, he lifted a finely woven broadcloth shirt, carefully cut, and very pink. What's that thing? This is a tablecloth, he said out of the side of his mouth. No, cut it out. What is it? This, he then answered with some pride, is going to be my emblem. Ma sent it up last week. Did you ever see stuff like this, and a color like this? It doesn't even button all the way down. You have to pull it over your head, like this. Over your head? Pink. It makes you look like a fairy, does it? He used this preoccupied tone when he was thinking of something more interesting than what you had said, but his mind always recorded what was said and played it back to him when there was time, so as he was buttoning the high collar in front of the mirror he said mildly, I wonder what would happen if I looked like a fairy to everyone, you're nuts, well, in case suitors begin clamoring at the door, you can tell them I'm wearing this as an emblem. He turned around to let me admire it. I was reading in the paper that we bombed Central Europe for the first time the other day. Only someone who knew Phineas as well as I did could realize that he was not changing the subject. I waited quietly for him to make whatever fantastic connection there might be between this and his shirt. Well, we've got to do something to celebrate. We haven't got a flag. We can't float old glory proudly out the window. So I'm going to wear this as an emblem. He did wear it. No one else in the school could have done so without some risk of having it torn from his back. When the sternest of the summer session's masters, old Mr. Patch Withers, came up to him after history class and asked about it, I watched his drawn but pink face become pinker with amusement as Finney politely explained the meaning of the shirt. It was hypnotism. I was beginning to see that Phineas could get away with anything. I couldn't help envying him that a little, which was perfectly normal. There was no harm in envying even your best friend a little. In the afternoon Mr. Patch Withers, who was substitute headmaster for the summer, offered the traditional term tea to the upper middle class. It was held in the deserted headmaster's house, and Mr. Patch Withers' wife trembled at every cup tinkle. We were in a kind of sun porch and conservatory combined, spacious and damp and without many plants. Those there were had large non-flowering stalks, with big barbaric leaves. The chocolate brown wicker furniture shot out menacing twigs, and three dozen of U.S. stood tensely teetering our cups amid the wicker and leaves, trying hard not to sound as inane in our conversation with the four present masters and their wives as they sounded to us. Phineas had soaked and brushed his hair for the occasion. This gave his head a sleek look, which was contradicted by the surprised, honest expression which he wore on his face. His ears, I had never noticed before, were fairly small and set close to his head, and combined with his plastered hair they now gave his bold nose and cheekbones the sharp look of a prow. He alone talked easily. He discussed the bombing of Central Europe. No one else happened to have seen the story, and since Phineas could not recall exactly what target in which country had been hit, or whether it was the American, British, or even Russian Air Force which had hit it, or what day he read it in which newspaper, the discussion was one-sided. That didn't matter. It was the event which counted. But after a while Finney felt he should carry the discussion to others. I think we ought to bomb the daylights out of them, as long as we don't hit any women or children or old people, don't you? He was saying to Mrs. Patch Withers, perched nervously behind her urn, or hospitals, he went on. And naturally no schools or churches. We must also be careful about works of art, she put in, if they are of permanent value. A lot of nonsense, Mr. Patchwithers grumbled, with a flushed face. How do you expect our boys to be as precise as that thousands of feet up with bombs weighing tons? Look at what the Germans did to Amsterdam. 
Look at what they did to Coventry. The Germans aren't the Central Europeans, dear, his wife said very gently. He didn't like being brought up short. But he seemed to be just able to bear it, from his wife. After a temperamental pause, he said gruffly, There isn't any permanent art in Central Europe anyway. Finney was enjoying this. He unbuttoned his seersucker jacket, as though he needed greater body freedom for the discussion. Mrs. Patchwither's glance then happened to fall on his belt. In a tentative voice she said, Isn't that the, hour, her husband looked, I panic. In his haste that morning, Finney had not unexpectedly used a tie for a belt. But this morning, the first tie at hand had been the Devon school tie. This time he wasn't going to get away with it. I could feel myself becoming unexpectedly excited at that. Mr. Patchwither's face was reaching a brilliant shade, and his wife's head fell as though, before the guillotine. Even Finney seemed to color a little, unless it was the reflection from his pink shirt. But his expression was composed, and he said in his resonant voice, I wore this, you see, because it goes with the shirt and it all ties in together, I didn't mean that to be a pun, I don't think they're very funny, especially in polite company, do you? It all ties in together with what we've been talking about, this bombing in Central Europe, because when you come right down to it, the school is involved in everything that happens in the war, it's all the same war and the same world, and I think Devon ought to be included. I don't know whether you think the way I do on that. Hello. I hope you enjoyed the video, since I loved making it. If you want your story showcased on the channel, the instructions are down below. Love you all, see you guys next time.